Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your host this evening as we explore the beauties and wonders of Croatia. Now, our guest this evening is Tina Hiti, a proud Slovenian woman who has found her calling sharing her sharing the sights of former Yugoslavia with her North American tour members. Tina has a special knack being so knowledgeable about her areas of expertise and yet never losing her sense of curiosity as a traveler. Tina, my friend and fellow tour guide, on behalf of the 821 households who are here with us tonight, welcome to Monday Night Travel. Dobro veče, dobro večer. Um, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for translating that because I didn't understand. Tina, I know that just a few days ago you were um, finishing up your last tour of the season. Uh, how was it being back after after a long absence? What was it like being back on the road this year? Unbelievably wonderful. Um, strenuous, um, but wonderful. I've been constantly touring from beginning of February up until now. I've never had such a busy season as this year, but it was wonderful. And actually, I do want to shout out a big hello to everybody who has traveled with me, even before COVID or this year, because I know a few of you are here. So a very big hello. Thank you, Tina. I'm sure they're happy to hear from you. Um, I know what a wonderful guide you are because I've been able to listen to you on many occasions. So I'm sure that your tour members are happy to see you tonight. Um, shall we start the show? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's get it going. Yugoslavia filled much of Europe's Balkan Peninsula during most of the 20th century. When Yugoslavia broke up into separate countries in the 1990s, Croatia wound up with most of its coastline. We start south in Dubrovnik, sail along the Dalmatian coast, stopping at Korčula and Var, en route to Split. After exploring Plitvica Lakes National Park and the capital city of Zagreb, we travel to the Istrian Peninsula to Rovin. Spectacularly set Dubrovnik is both historic and a hit with tourists. It's understandably Croatia's top draw. Whether surveying its stout walls, joining the promenade along its main drag, or appreciating its former glory, it's clear this city was a major power in the past and is a major draw today. Exploring its evocative back lanes, relaxing on its pebbly beaches, or just pondering its majestic setting, Dubrovnik is simply delightful. So I would just like to say that Dubrovnik is so delightful and so perfectly another time and place that you will not be surprised if you are just on the street in October and six gentlemen playing the drums in medieval dress walk by because they're going to perform at a wedding. So this is what I saw on the street last October. Dubrovnik is the pearl of the Adriatic. In fact, we'll cover it in more detail in another episode. For this program, we'll leave the crowds of Dubrovnik and explore the less appreciated corners of Croatia. So Tina, this episode is, is mostly everything but Dubrovnik, but I would just like to um, have you give them a thumbnail sketch so that they can carefully and fairly compare Dubrovnik with the rest of the places that we're gonna talk about in the episode. Yeah, I would say of all the places on this tour, probably Dubrovnik is the most known one, uh, partly because of the cruise ships, partly because of the Game of Thrones, a series that HBO has filmed. And it is a big drag also for other tourists around this area to come and vacation over there. Um, for the American visitors, maybe it's interesting as a fact that in 1783, Dubrovnik Republic was one of the first ones to recognize America as an independent country. Um, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and actually, because of all that, it seems to be very crowded at times, but you can avoid those crowds when you just plan smartly and maybe go and stay an overnight or two. Um, go early in the morning and late in the evening hours when the cruise shippers are gone. 
um, and try to find little tiny things like locals that do some fun stuff. I have two very good friends, Zlatko and Maria, who do eat with locals. And this is what can stumble upon your table if you come there. Um, all of the ingredients that they use with their cooking is actually local, from local farmers, from local producers, comes from the markets um, of Dubrovnik. And I am sure that you don't find that kind of a meal in any of the restaurants. Um, the thing that you see in the middle with the white little decor um, is actually a bread. Um, and bread is a big staple of the diet over here. If you want to do a gluten-free diet, it's not a place to go because we eat bread with everything on everything, even with dessert sometimes. So try to not be on a diet. Bread is very good, um, but it needs to be white. It needs to be fluffy. And it just goes really well with all the cold sliced salamis and cheeses. Prosciutto is one of the best salamis that you can, well, actually one of the best cold cuts that you can get in that part. And if, you know, if they are in a mood, they might also bring you over here. In a far distance, you can see that there is Dubrovnik, and then you can just have a beautiful picnic lunch with a view. Um, really, really uh, popular place with no tourist inside. So there are still a lot of this hidden pockets of tranquility and peace, even um, steps away from the main part of Dubrovnik. And be sure that there will be bread, there will be salt, there will be wine, there will be rakia. And actually, Lisa, I have brought something tonight with me um, to kind of nibble upon. Um, my platter looks similar to the one that you have right here. Um, actually, if you want, I can show it to you. Please. Right over there, I do have my prosciutto, I have some cheese, I have some tomatoes and vegetables. Sometimes people say we don't eat a lot of them. We do, but we are not too fond of them. We prefer prosciutto if we have a choice. And of course, together with that, I also have some very nice white bread, fluffy bread. Um, that goes really well along with that. And to water things down, I'm not drinking wine. It's a little too um, late in the evening for me but you could do a little bit of this. And for those of you who have been on any of the either Adriatic or Eastern Europe tours, you know that when we come to Croatia, we do drink this drink and it's not water, even if it's see-through, it's actually fire water called Slivovitz. Um, and this is what a lot of people would offer you as a sign of a welcome. If you come to visit them at their house, at their restaurant, uh, we believe in the healing powers of um, Slivovitz. We believe one slip of it a day sends a doctor away. Um, so yeah, you might want to try it, but it's pretty strong. Um, and as you can see, it's a see-through liquid. It's not water, I promise. There's no label, Tina. Uh, of course, there's no label. The best one always comes without the label because you always go and get it from the farmer. Um, you have a very long relationship with some people um, and you actually buy from local producers, not the supermarket one. That's much better, much healthier. You know that the plums were handpicked by the farmer that actually distilled this. Okay, I'm convinced. <laughs> and I'm not drinking. It's a, it's, yeah, I think it would be a fascinating show afterwards if I could um, do a few shots of that. <laughs> I have to say, uh, when we talked yesterday, I was like, oh, Slivovitz, I love Slivovitz. And I was like, I cannot drink Slivovitz and do my job. It's not, <laughs> not possible. But I do have my little snack. So you said prosciutto. So I, br I brought some prosciutto as well. And these little pomegranate uh, crackers. So I didn't have any white fluffy bed, bread, sadly. Okay. So well, I'm going to have to come to Yeah. All right. You ready? Yes, I am. Boats big and small connect Dubrovnik to the rest of Croatia. We're setting sail along the scenic Dalmatian coast with its countless islands. They're all variations on the same theme, rugged limestone features with historic port towns and sparsely populated interiors. The rocky soil and persistent sun are good for grapes. And the pebbly beaches with crystal clear water are both pristine and inviting. We're visiting two islands and first up is Korčula. 
visitors enjoy its mini Dubrovnik vibe. You'll find a fortified peninsula under a striking mountain backdrop. In the old town, narrow lanes come with an easygoing charm. Like other Croatian coastal towns, Korčula has two parts. The functional practical side, where most people park, eat, and sleep, and the time warp old town. Rather than stay in a big resort hotel, I'm staying in a sobe. That's a room rented in a private home. I called ahead. My hosts, Lenny and Peter, met me at the boat. They rent six rooms in their house, buried deep in Korčula's old town. A 500-year-old building can be tight. This room may be small, but it's comfortable, air-conditioned, and half the price of a hotel. And a great location. They claim Marco Polo lived just up the street. The town's charm. Gina, um, Americans might not be familiar with Sobe. Can you explain what a Sobe is? Yeah, Sobe actually translates to rooms. So it's an, I would say, a Croatian predecessor of Airbnb of today. And those are actually rooms that can vary from very simple accommodation to a very luxurious one. A lot of them are equipped with kitchens as well, or a little studio, so you can prepare your meals over there. Um, and they are mostly located in the center of the towns, while the majority of these Croatian islands would have also larger hotels, but not in the old towns. The old towns are too small. So the hotels are built on the outskirts, uh, maybe a little too far away from enjoying the charm of the old cities. Um, and a lot of the hotels are not very fond of having people to stay just for two, three nights uh, because they want the long-term stay. They want the vacationers, the ones that come for either one or two weeks. And you might get a better deal at Sobe, um, but definitely you might get a better cooperation or communication with the locals as well because hotels sometimes seem a little impersonal while the Sobe can come with some really thrifty locals and with some very nice stories to come along. I think, Lisa, you stayed at one of them and you had a good experience, right? I did. I stayed at two Sobe's on my trip last October. Um, and one of them, the lady was just super nice and, and sweet and really helpful. And, and the other one, actually, we ended up talking for an hour. She was in Dubrovnik and we talked about her life and her husband, who was a maritime captain, and the the bombings and that the the roof had been through and the remodeling she'd had to do. It was a really wonderful connection that we made in that hour. And so I wouldn't have had that if I were at a hotel. So I really recommend Sobe. Yeah, true, true. Rooms are all within a few steps. The historic gate is a reminder that Korchula was once a mighty little place. Facades recall its 14th century trading heyday. Each lane contributes to the evocative medieval townscape, dripping with drying laundry and local character. You can savor it all over a cup of coffee. If you want to enjoy the Croatian cafe scene, it helps to know a few words. For a latte, it's biela kava. That's white coffee. Tina, when we spoke yesterday, you said, I really think we need to go deeper into the coffee culture. So as somebody from Seattle, I would never argue with that. So Tina, what do you want us to know about the coffee culture in Croatia? Well, I would say that coffee drinking is an essential part of the local culture. Um, it's an essential part of your stay if you go and vacation in Croatia. Um, although the size of coffee that Rick, Rick drank was a little too big. Usually the size of coffee cup is about this big, so very tiny, like my, my tump, something like that. And it's usually only half filled. And the local people are able to sit down for coffee and just enjoy um, that little tiny cup of coffee for either a half hour, that's minimum, up until two hours. So, and they can just sit down, drink, chat with the locals. There is an expression, let's go and have a coffee that's never rushed, never you hurry, never you go fast. And there's two words that actually um, go really well with the coffee culture in Croatia. One is called laganini, which means slowly, slowly, doing, in, doing everything in a very slow manner, um, without stressing, um, just a very easygoing lifestyle, um, kind of sweetness of doing nothing at all. In Italy, this is laganini in, in Croatia. And then almost an important 
um, an unofficial slogan of Dalmatia all throughout the Croatian coastline would be Pomalo, P-O-M-A-L-O, -O, so Pomalo, a little at a time, which means no stress, no problem, relax, chill, take it easy. And I have a good, I have a good um, representation here because I have a good friend that has a travel agency. And every time I come to Croatia, I go and visit her. And of course we go for coffee. It's an obligatory thing. And we sit down, she locks her agency. It's in the middle of the working week. And I'm thinking probably she'll take a break for about 20 minutes, maybe half an hour maximum. Uh -uh. We sit for an hour, maybe two. And I already get a little worried because I come from the part of this world that's more Austrian, like, you know, very punctual down to the time. While in Dalmatia, it's really easy going. And I ask her, shouldn't you go and reopen the agency? And she says, well, if it's urgent, they'll come tomorrow. Oh, Malo. That's her answer. And I know maybe in American world, it's really unheard of. But over here, you really have to adapt to this style. Otherwise, you will not be having fun. So try to do at least one coffee while you stay in Croatia for two hours, but it needs to be a small cup. I'm sorry, so they take like micro sips of the coffee? Yes, just little tiny sips and talk and chat. And, you know, we also believe in the fact that when coffee gets cold, you become prettier, so. All right. <laughs> We're setting sail again. Both lumbering car ferries and sleek cruise ships carry Dalmatia's many visitors efficiently from port to port. In ancient times, Greeks and Romans sailed up and down this coastline, establishing many trade settlements. The island of Bar was settled and named by the Greeks in the 4th century BC. The island's main town, also named Bar, nestles under its formidable fortress. Its handy boat connections make this a popular stop. While mobbed with tourists in peak season, we're here in late May, and it's more sleepy than chic. Like most major towns along the Adriatic coastline, the fortified harbor of Var was a strategic link in a vast 16th century Venetian trading empire. Its fortress, walls, tower, and palaces all built by and for the Venetians. Activities are low energy. Expertly enjoying this town, seemingly made for relaxing, yachters stern tie into the good life. Oh man, Lisa, you're killing me right now. <laughs> I've got something that you had on your Instagram page um, that I have always oh wondered God. about. <laughs> Tina, really? what's going on here? Can I just go there right now? Well, that's actually paradise on earth for me. Um, this is where... My family and I vacation every year, and we have been going here for about 15, even more than 15 years. And we take about three, four weeks off, and we just chill and relax, do nothing at all. And we try to actually um, incorporate into our life, at least for a month every year, um, the relaxed state of body and mind um, that Dalmatians call fiaca. Uh, which is actually all Dalmatians are born with it. You know, um, Dalmatians have even a joke that, you know, a lot of people go to India to, you know, exercise in the shrines, to go and do the yoga retreats and meditation. They are born with that already in Dalmatia. So they know exactly how to do fiaka. And it actually, they believe that fiaka, doing nothing at all, cures illness, makes you look and feel younger. Um, so after every visit over here, after every month spending in Khvar, um, yeah, I must say I feel younger. But this is where we do just nothing, you know. Um, our vacation is very different from the vacation that you might do. Uh, we usually drive down from Slovenia. It takes about five and a half hours. We take a two-hour ferry ride. And then after that, we just um, park our car and we don't move it. And we just move a little bit from our apartment to the beach and that's it. And we stay on the beach all day long. We swim, we paddle board, the, the kids fish, um, play water games. Um, and then, you know, in the evening hours, we sit down, we talk, we play cards, we drink some wine, we eat some wonderful food. Oh, really paradise on earth. I just want to go there right now. 
Well, thank you for telling us about how your family vacations, because it sounds a little bit different than, <laughs> um, than the average American vacation. So thank you, Tina. No problem. Visitors nurse drinks on the main square. Stroll the back lanes where you may come upon a musical surprise. <laughs> Local a cappella choirs perform klapa music, the quintessential Dalmatian folk music. Every town has their all male klapa choir. These songs of seafaring life, of love's lost and love's found, stir the souls of Croatians and visitors alike. music uh, available easily to travelers? Yeah, actually, clapper music can be just a very impromptu singing on the streets along the Dalmatian coastline. Um, you can find it in a lot of the streets, especially during the summer season. And then um, during the fall, beginning of the fall in September, there's a big concert. All the clapper uh, choirs come to split and actually they perform in the football stadium. It's a big event that happens for the whole weekend and it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, actually, Klapa has been inscribed into the UNESCO World Heritage List as the intangible um, heritage of cultural heritage of humanity back in 2012. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful place um, to go and listen to it if you are ever in Split at that time. Um, and actually, Klapa choirs usually sing about love, about, you know, home, about the land. So they also sing about fiaka, so the relaxed state of body and mind. And actually, the lyrics go like this. Fiaka, you save my life. Fiaka, you are my remedy. You make me happy when I'm super slow. You turn my life around when I embrace your flow. Oh, Sorry that's wonderful. <laughs> But yeah, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah, and now just imagine somebody would singing singing it to you, and you're sitting on the beach, you know, just sleep, sipping a little bit of vino, and just enjoying the life go by. Wonderful. I'm picturing myself on that swing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it comes to meal time here on the coast. It's got to be seafood. Hardworking restaurants seem to abide by the local creed. Eating meat is food. Eating fish, that's pleasure. Our waiter reminded us that a fish should swim three times. First in the sea, then in olive oil, Finally, in wine. After a little island hopping, approaching urban split, Croatia's second city, feels like a return to civilization. So many Dalmatian coast towns feel tailor-made for tourism, split is a serious port. It's vibrant with or without its visitors. Split feels modern, but a close look at the surviving facade of a Roman palace fronting its harbor reveals the city's ancient roots. Today's residents are literally living in a Roman emperor's palace. 
in the fourth century AD when Roman Emperor Diocles. I hate to interrupt Rick here, but I want to point out that this is um, Perry Steel Square. And um, the hotel that I want to give a shout out to later is just about 100 yards from here. And this is where they have live music in the evenings at the Luxar Bar. You can see on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you see a red cushion. So people will take cushions and they'll sit around here. Um, and Tina, you have even more experience on this square than I do. Yeah, so this square, actually, the musicians that are there are usually local musicians that don't have, um, you know, any big gigs yet. So they do pay them a little bit and they can perform for numerous tourists that actually come around. And sometimes, you know, this whole square turns in the evening into a dance, um, dance floor and it's just wonderful. Um, and many times this square is used for different other events, you know, from fashion shows to wine festivities, to different gastronomical treats, uh, to gladiator shows, to the welcoming of the Diocletian and all of those things. But I would say in the evening hours, it really is magical. And now the scaffolding is gone as well. So um, you can enjoy in its pristine beauty, really. And you can actually see the Sphinx as well in the lower left-hand side corner, kind of hiding behind, behind the scaffolding. It's really a magical place. So we'll hear the music in a little bit, but well, I wanted you to see this and now back to Rick. Retired. He built a vast residence for his golden years here in his native Dalmatia. When Rome fell, Diocletian's palace was abandoned. Eventually, a medieval town sprouted from its abandoned shell, and to this day, the maze of narrow alleys, once literally Diocletian's hallways, makes up the core of Split. Local guide Maya Benzone is joining us to help explain the story behind her hometown. The palace was huge, 200 meters on each side, and these were just the basements. So you can imagine what was on the upper floor. Roman engineers could build anything. So they had concrete, they had bricks, round arches, yeah. all the technology. They had the technology and they had the slaves. Cheap labor. Yes. So I just wanted to um, share this, this next thing with you. So Croatia has grown a lot in popularity um, and thanks to the HBO show Game of Thrones, which Tina mentioned earlier. So I shot this little clip as a nod to our MNT family. If we have any Game of Thrones fans, this is for you. And because it was just so darn atmospheric. Hi, it's Lisa. I'm in Split, Croatia at Diocletian's Palace. And if I were going to hide my dragons, this is where I'd do it. We also get a lot of comments about sometimes iPhone videos being really shaky. So I tried so hard to keep it steady. Nearby, a grand underground hallway, now used as a shopping arcade, leads to Diocletian's vestibule. This is a grand entryway towards Diocletian's private area, private quarters. Roman emperors call themselves the gods, and Diocletian called himself Jovius, son of a god Jupiter. Uh, people worship him, so they were kissing his robe. They treated him like a god on earth. Diocletian's mausoleum dominated the center of the palace complex. Much of the original Roman building survives. The impressive dome, columns and capitals, and fine carved reliefs. Diocletian was notorious for persecuting Christians. But centuries later, in the Middle Ages, his mausoleum was converted into a cathedral. And so, ironically, what Diocletian built to glorify his memory is used instead to remember his victims, Christian martyrs, like this one who was tied to a millstone and tossed into the sea. A few steps away is a temple dedicated to Jupiter. Yeah, this is originally carved. This is all part of Diocletian's palace complex. Yes, we are still walking in the area of Diocletian's palace. And you know, Diocletian was a Jovius. And here in the middle of the palace, he erected the house for his father. This is the Jupiter's temple. And for a Roman building, it's very rare that it's completely preserved with the ceiling, with the roof. So on the ceiling, you can see really nice Roman curvings. You can see some faces, some flowers. 
later on during the history in the Middle Ages, this was converted into the church. So this was the medieval baptistry. We have St. John the Baptist, and here we have the baptismal font. And we have this curious panel here in the front. We have Croatian king from the 11th century. We have a bishop standing just next to him, and underneath his feet we have a citizen. So you've got the secular power, the religious power, and the people respecting the power. That would be it. Because this is a baptistry, here we have a statue of St. John the Baptist. Uh, this is a modern work of the 20th century made by the greatest Croatian sculptor ever, Ivan Mestrovic. A highlight for me is simply people watching. The sea of Croatian humanity laps at the walls of Diocletian's palace along the pedestrian promenade, or Riva. As on similar promenades throughout the Mediterranean world, the cars have made way for the people. Strolling locals finish their days in good style just enjoying life's simple pleasures in a city made friendly for its residents. So um, this is what I wanted to show you. Um, everyone, this is the view from my room at the Hotel um, Perry Steel, and it's not very easy to hear, but there's music playing and you can see the pink and purple lights. Um, but before we show this, I just wanted to say, um, since Rick did this video 12 years ago, I found that um, Split had grown, has grown into a top-notch coastal city. And it, to me, it rivals Dubrovnik because of its higgledy-piggledy lanes or quirky and exotic. Um, I thought the sites were one of a kind. Tina, what are your views on Split? Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, Lisa. Actually, I love Split. I think it's a wonderful place. Um, and I think comparing it with Dubrovnik is that Dubrovnik is more of a you know tourist attraction, especially when you are in the old town and you can see majority of people there are tourists. Um, while in the split, this is a real actual city. This is where the locals also come out for drinks. Um, it's a living um, organism and it's just such a wonderful place to go through those uh, cobbled streets, uh, meandering the streets. It's a university town, so there will be a lot of young people. And from when this show was actually filmed, um, Split has changed immensely because it really became a very popular tourist destination. There's a lot of amazing restaurants in Split. I think you can find better food here than you do in Dubrovnik. Um, and there's also, you know, a lot of things to do. Museums are small but wonderful. Um, there's a lot of little parks that you can walk to. Um, and there's always that atmospheric thing where you know, something local is happening uh, from wine festivals to let's say a football match and all the cheerleaders come down to the streets to this wonderful concerts in the evening hours. So really there's always something going on. It's really a wonderful place. Well, let's enjoy this for a second before we head out of town. While the coast is Croatia's main draw, some of its best attractions are inland. We're delving into the Croatian heartland. One of Europe's top natural wonders is Plitvica Lakes National Park. Imagine Niagara Falls sliced and diced and sprinkled over a vast and heavily forested canyon. It's a lush and unforgettable valley of 16 terraced lakes, laced together by waterfalls and miles of pleasant plank walks. Boats glide visitors into the heart of the park. Countless cascades and water that's strangely clear yet full of vibrant colors make Plitvica a misty natural wonderland. Fish seem to know there's not a hook for miles. Carefully maintained trails and boardwalks let you get intimate with the wonder of the place. Observant nature lovers can choose from hundreds of flower types to assemble a photographic bouquet. The stony formations drip down like the foliage because the grass and moss both direct the flow of the water 
and provide a kind of scaffolding for the slow and steady calcification process. Naturalists call Pleitvitsa a perfect storm of geological, climatic, and biological features. The magic ingredient, calcium carbonate, a mineral deposit from the limestone that gets dissolved into the water, then redeposited, continually breaking down natural travertine dams and building up new ones. Before we leave Pleitvitsa, um, Tina, would you let us know if, if there is any need for any crowd control strategies for Plavitsa? And if yeah. so, what? Yeah, definitely, Lisa, I would recommend. Um, so if you are there on an individual visit, so you actually rented a car or came with a local transportation, uh, be sure that you enter as early as possible. Um, sometimes in the summer, the park is open already at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you cannot ride with the tram, but you can walk it for the first part and you can actually have the park for yourself. Uh, do not go after nine o'clock because that is where the majority of groups are coming and it gets really packed. Um, if you're traveling in a group with us, um, then we have a little bit of a leeway and we can actually uh, go in in entrance to and then kind of start the first section of the park enough early enough that we can see the beauty of the upper lakes without crowds and then maybe we just need to fight a little bit and do some elbow action on the lower area of the park uh, but yeah there is a possibility starting early um, and definitely sometimes even uh, going into the park in the afternoon hours um, would be as well a good solution and going in the off season um, off season mostly would be either from the middle of March, April, um, and then after middle of September and going into October. Um, October is beautiful. The colors of the leaves are changing um, and it's just a sight for the eyes. Um, I was in Plitvica also in the winter where there's nobody. The waterfalls can be frozen sometimes and not the whole section of the park is open, but it's another, another kind of magic. So anytime you go and visit, um, it's beautiful. Try to avoid it in the month of mid-May to mid-June and maybe just a little bit early September because that is when we have school field trips. And that is where you will have a lot of kids walking around the park and they mostly do not know how to walk single file and they do not respect the nature with quietness. So they are a little bit on the loud side. Um, so if you wanna enjoy it in peace, maybe choose other time of the year to go and travel there. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Our next stop, the capital city, Zagreb. You can't get a complete picture of modern Croatia without a visit here. This lively and livable city is home to one out of every six Croatians. Jelicic Square, the Times Square of Zagreb, is boisterous with modern commerce and local life. The statue depicts the square's namesake, Josip Jelicic, the 19th century national hero who still inspires Croatians today. Seeing the city buzz with activity, you feel the energy of urban Croatia. Night or day, the streets are a parade of stylish locals, confident and looking good. friendly business zone comes with the energy and bustle you'd expect to find in any prosperous European capital. Whether you're enjoying an outdoor cafe, window shopping, or just lounging in one of the city's many inviting parks, Zagreb makes you wonder, where are all the tourists? Zagreb's historic upper town blankets a hill. Its main square is home to Croatia's government. The National Parliament building flies both the Croatian and European flags. Dominating the square is the Church of St. Mark, with a colorfully tiled roof depicting both the coat of arms of Croatia and the city seal of Zagreb. Nearby is the Croatian Museum of Naive Art. This charming collection features lyrical landscapes and village scenes painted in the mid-20th century by self-taught peasant artists. While some are on canvas, most are painted on glass, a cheap and readily available material that was easier to work on. Naive art is created by untrained artists isolated from the artistic mainstream. They paint it in a figurative way, 
while the rest of the artistic world embraced increasingly in abstract style. Generalic, shown here in a self-portrait, was the father of the Croatian naive art movement. In 1953, he took his art to a show in Paris as a relative unknown. He was a huge hit, sold everything, and came home rich and famous. These Croatian naive artists were outsiders, sought out by art world insiders to validate their notion that artistic ability was more than a learned skill. It was an inborn talent. In places such as rural Croatia, medieval lifestyles survived well into the 20th century. You see a lot of winter scenes because these artists were farmers first, busy tending their fields through the growing season. They painted their village world, isolated from the modern world. In a complex age, many urbanites found this art refreshing for its brute simplicity. Tucked inside Zagreb's only surviving town gate is an evocative chapel. The focal point is a painting of Mary that miraculously survived a fire in 1731. People, young and old, passing through, stop here briefly to worship. Pausing reverently, the faithful bring their concerns to Mary. Many candles represent Zagrebian prayers. Smoke-stained plaques on the wall give thanks, Vala, for prayers answered. Just down the road is a thriving pedestrian zone, Zagreb's main cafe street and urban promenade. Comfy seating encourages people to slow down and enjoy each other's company. Sitting here, it's clear, Zagrebians love their city. Are they having fiaca? Well, kind of, but in Zagreb, you know, it's it's not really called fiaca because that's more of a Dalmatian way. It's just the coffee culture and Laganini style. You know, you could see that all the cafeterias are really full. Um, they do take their time for coffee. And as Rick said, this is a very stylish city, so there's a lot to see. Um, it's a shame that Zagreb is not on many itineraries because it's really a fun city to go to. It's very different from the rest of Croatia, architectural way, also in the way um, the food is prepared and served. It's very different. Um, it has a totally different vibe than the coastline. Um, and there's a lot of funky museums to see. The one we visited in the show is the Naive Art Museum, but there's also the Museum of so-called Broken Relationships, um, where actually a couple that has broken apart have an object that they fight about and instead of fighting about they just donated it to the museum and there's a story about it so it's a really fabulous one. Um, Zagreb also has an amazing um, airport that's really well connected so I would say flying in and out of Zagreb would definitely be a very good situation but just be sure to include a few more days over there and if you're there in the Christmas time like now um, Advent in Zagreb, actually the Christmas market in Zagreb is among the best ones in Europe, actually for three consecutive years in 2016, 17 and 18, it has gotten an award of the best Christmas market in all of Europe. And I know this might take a lot of you by surprise because a lot of you maybe think that Christmas markets are the best in Germany or Austria. Uh, remember um, this part of the world is also pretty fabulous and we do things for Christmas also in a very special way and it's worthwhile checking it out. Thank you, that's a great tip for our viewers. Thanks to new freeways, the Istrian Peninsula in Croatia's northwest corner is just a couple hours drive from the capital. In the Istrian interior, you'll find a thickly forested landscape of rolling hills and family farms. Istria is dotted with picturesque hill towns, striped with vineyards, and busy with hardworking farmers. Dramatically situated high above the vineyards, Motovun is Istria's most popular hill town. Its modest main square is the only flat place in town ideal for budding soccer stars. Tina, you've spent a lot of time in the Istrian Peninsula of Croatia, and can you share why you've spent so much time there and how it has influenced you? Yeah, so actually, as you know, 
Um, I'm from Slovenia, but Slovenia has been a part of Yugoslavia, same as Croatia. Uh, there was no borders between us in the past and back in the Yugoslav days. Um, a lot of people actually purchased an apartment house or a little weekend house on the coastline. Um, and usually they would do something very close to the to the nowadays border. In the past, there was no border. Um, and that's where you would go on vacation. So pretty much from when I was born up until the age of 15 uh, till 1991, um, we've spent two and a half months on the coastline. So um, in Istria, so I have a lot of friends over there. Um, I know a lot about the local cuisine. Um, I know a lot about the local hiking trails, biking trails. Um, and I would say it has really helped me evolve into a good guide in the Eastrian area because of the of the fact that I've spent a lot of time over there. And I keep on returning to Istria because um, my sister married into Istria as well. She lives very close to Rovin right now. Um, and we go and visit very often. So I do have a lot of friends and I kind of get the Istrian lifestyle. It's a big mix of different cultures um, mixing and melting together from Italian, Slovenian and Croatian. And it's a really wonderful place to visit. Thank you. The church's crenulated tower is a reminder that these towns were built on hilltops not for the view, but for protection. But today, strolling the ramparts, it's clear. The panorama is a big part of the town's appeal. As the day ends, the square is made to order for alfresco dining. I find that sometimes the best experiences don't come to you. You need to find them. An after-dinner stroll with a sense of curiosity gets me a seat at the rehearsal of the local Klapa group. A short drive to the coast takes us to Rovin, my favorite stop between Dubrovnik and Venice. The town rises dramatically from the Adriatic, as if being pulled up to heaven by its grand bell tower. The church that crowns Rovin is dedicated to the fourth century martyr Saint Euphemia. Her statue functions as a weather vane. Scaling the church bell tower's creaky wooden stairway requires an enduring faith in the reliability of wood. From the top is a commanding view, and if you're here at high noon, an ear-splitting memory. The town's history created its current shape. Medieval Rovin was a walled island because it offered safe harbor from both pirates and the plague, Rovine became extremely crowded. That explains today's pleasantly claustrophobic old town. Like the rest of the Croatian coast, Rovine was part of the Venetian Empire for centuries, and Istria remained part of Italy until after World War II. That's why this region is enthusiastically bilingual, an engaging mix of Croatia and Italy. Rovin's vibrant market is a fun place to shop for a picnic and snack on free samples. Dobra. Ora ho. Ora. Ora ho. Dobro. Nice. Thank you. It also has a gifty corner where salesmen tempt visiting tourists with the local specialties. So white truffle. Paste. White, white truffle. Yes. Very nice. Dobro. Thank you. No souvenir. Eat it. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao. Tina, we had spoken, you wanted to share something with our viewers. So let me get that up on the screen. There we go. What is this all about, Tina? 
Actually, this is a very wonderful meal that I've had this summer in one of the restaurants in Motovun. And on top of it, as you can see, there is something light brownish shredded on top, and that's the truffles. Actually, truffles are a very big deal in all of Istria. Um, together with Piedmont and France, one area in France, uh, Croatia, the area around Motovun, is one of the biggest locations to find truffles, both white and black. Black usually grow under the roots of the trees. Those are the most precious mushrooms. Um, and they can be found with either pigs or dogs. Um, in Croatia, it's the dogs that actually um, smell for them. And then you can dig them yourself once the dog sniffles it. And usually the black ones grow um, throughout the year, um, but the most common season for them is between July and early September. And then from about September up until end of November, it's the more precious white truffle that grows um, that actually can go into high prices. For example, per kilo of a white truffle, they can get to about 2,500 euros. And accidentally, um, in year 1999, uh, Mr. Giancarlo Zigante, um, who was coming from the nearby of Motun, has found the world's largest white truffle. It weighed 1.3 kilos. I'm not sure how much that is, but that's a big truffle. And actually, he had to lock it up into the safe up until the moment that the Guinness World Book of Record Committee came to measure it, to weigh it, and to actually take a few pictures. And Throughout that time, he has gotten a lot of offers uh, to sell it, but he didn't want to because the community and the local association among locals and local folks is so strong that Giancarlo Zigante decided to actually donate the whole white truffle and make a very big party and a feast for all the local people. And they've just eaten it locally. And I think that's a wonderful story. Um, but definitely, if you want to try some, some truffles, do come to Istria. Wonderful, wonderful. A lot of local cuisine has it inside, um, including some gelato and, and chocolate, if you want to try that. And maybe, by the way, um, Lisa, because I didn't bring any truffle chocolate, but I do have, I think, Croatian's best chocolate um, that actually brings back a lot of amazing memories. Um, I don't want to make commercial for anything, but all of the former Yugoslavs actually have grown up with this brand of chocolate called Krash. I don't know if you can see the name. The label is kind of up here. And the chocolate is Bayadera. And actually, this was good chocolate, which was only eaten on special occasions. And if we had maybe visitors that were coming up to our house, mom would usually buy that in a supermarket. And then this little uh, candy would be waiting for the visitors to come. But of course, all of us kids, um, we might have been a, a, lit, a little bit anxious. And I know of a few, um, you wouldn't know of any, uh, that actually cut through this foil. You know, there's like a little foil on the wrapper and we would cut easily through with a little knife and then take a few out just like this. Look at this. We would take one or two out because of course parents would not notice at all. And then we would put it back in like nothing happened. And when mom would open that, when visitors would come, of course she would be in a very big surprise because the box was not full. And we all just kind of, you know, pretend that nothing happened. Um, but this is something that we really grew on. Uh, Krash actually has a lot of great stuff. Um, and I would say we, in this part of the world, we're all addicted by chocolate a little bit. We all love it, no matter it, in what kind of shape it comes. Um, it's the best gift to give to any of the people from this part of the world. Uh, this is also what we would bring as gifts to other people's homes when we go visit. Um, so yeah, chocolate, always a good thing. And there is even the one with truffles, but I think this one is much better. And the candy oh. looks like this, just that I show you the candy. See. Yeah, put it right up there. Yeah. Baya Dera. What happens if you open it, Tina? Oh, okay. I can open it too. Well, then it will disappear because I'll just eat it. <laughs> Look at this. Yeah. It's, it's like this. It's nougat cream and chocolate. So nougat cream is in the middle and then chocolate on top. It's really good. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I'm eating it for all of you and I'm enjoying it big time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We applaud no you. No problem. <laughs> I'll start the video up so you can enjoy the chocolate. Yes, it's very good. The twisting back lanes of crumbling old ravines seem designed for a photo safari. Arches span narrow alleys which open into hidden courtyards. The main drag leading up to the top of the island is lined with art galleries. Understandably, artists love ravine. And so do romantics. At the Valentino Bar, the old town tumbles right into the sea. It's a memorable place to cap your ravine day. You grab a cushion and settle into a cozy stone nook. Enjoy a drink, your travel partner, and the Adriatic sunset. Thank you, Tina, so much for, for sharing that episode with us. Um, before we get to our questions, and we have quite a few, I have a word from our sponsor. So just today, we have launched our Seasons Givings holiday event for our tour members. So anyone who signs up for a brand new or who brand new signs up for a 2023 tour gets a hundred dollar discount off the tour and a hundred dollars will be donated on your behalf to a, a charity that's on our website. So you save a hundred dollars, Angie Force receives Europe to donate a hundred dollars. So that's win-win. Um, and you can see all the details on our website. So. Tina, are you ready for some questions? I am. I am. You finished your chocolate? I did, I did. It was good. I'm tempted to have a second one, but maybe later after the questions. <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking the time for all of this. So um, let's see. Okay, Matt has, a, Matt has a good one right off the bat. Are there any female musical traditions in Croatia? Um, actually, there's female clappers as well. At the beginning, clappers was mostly just men, but then later on in the later years, it's also women clapper that exist. Yes, so it's exactly the same, just that all only women sing. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Um, Deborah would like to know what crafts or traditional foods would one find at the Advent market, the Christmas oh. market in Zagreb? Okay, you could get um, for drinks, you could easily get mulled wine. Um, we like the mulled wine. It's wine that it's actually uh, warmed up with a little bit of clove, cinnamon, um, a little bit of, of um, water to dilute it a little bit so it's not so strong. And they add a bit of sugar inside so it's nice and sweet and warm and just wonderful. Um, and they usually serve it also with a bit of orange inside. You have different punches. At the moment, a very cool thing to drink around here is warm or hot gin. Um, it's not bad at all in different flavors. Um, and of course, a lot of non-alcoholic teas and, and stuff for the kids. And from the food, um, a lot of it has to do with some local specialties. So there's a lot of sausages. We are in the corner of Croatia that actually has a bit of the influence from the Austrian side. So you have a lot of sausages. You would have very popular burgers right now. Um, you would also have a lot of different dumplings. Uh, there's a lot of rolled pastries called povitica. Um, so there's a lot of stuff like that. And you just go from one place to another. Um, I know that Krash, the chocolate place, has a stand with hot chocolates um, in the flavors of different candies that they produce. Um, and they also have cakes. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of real specialty things. Sometimes also deep fried little donuts in like this size, the size of a ball that's just covered with a bit of uh, powdered sugar. Um, then you have crepes with different fillings. So different areas, different things. And it goes according to the square. So one square would have music, one square, one square would have ice skating, one square would then have the food, one square would have maybe um, some photographic images where you can also take and post some, some places. There is international corner where you have stalls that come from the neighborhood countries. So it's really fascinating. It's really a good place. Are there any um, 
any gifts that one would look look for, like a traditional craft from Croatia? Yeah, traditional craft would be uh, gingerbread made hearts um, with decoration, usually with the sign Zagreb on. So that would be one of them. Uh, traditional jewelry being made, um, lace as well, uh, different napkins, embroideries. So those would be a few of those. Thank you. Keeping in the holiday theme, Amani would like to know, what is Croatia like on Easter? How does that affect travelers? It uh, doesn't affect travelers a lot. Uh, there's a lot more services taking place. Croatia is a very religious country, so there will be a lot of services. A lot of times when people bring uh, food to be blessed, um, you would see a lot of family gatherings. Um, but not a lot of things are truly closed because Croatia is relying on tourism a lot. Um, so not a lot of things would be closed. Sometimes museums, maybe, yes, for one day, uh, but shops and other stuff should be open and restaurants as well, because that's also when sometimes the local people go out and eat. Barbara would like to know, does one need to learn a little Croatian or is English widely spoken? Um, I would say when you travel to smaller countries, no matter where you go, either it's Croatia or any other place, it's always smart as a traveler to learn a few words. It actually shows locals that you are trying, that you want to appreciate the culture, and you will get a bit of smiles from people's faces. Uh, generally, Croatians are really good with languages. Um, English is widely spoken more with the younger than with the older. The older in the past were taught more German than English. Um, so you might come across if you speak some German as well. Um, but other than that, if you are struggling, just go to a young person. And I would say no problem with the language because there's no barrier at all. Well, Tina, since we have you here, would you mind giving us a please and thank you? Hello and goodbye. Okay, yes. So please is um, molim, molim, M-O-L-I-M, -M, molim. And then hvala is thank you, which is very hard because it has an H and a V together. In this part of the world, we put consonants together as many as possible. We don't like the vowels. Um, too much, you know, too much of a mess. So hvala, H-V-A-L-A, hvala. But in Croatia, they make it easier for you because you can only say it in a dialect that is being used in Zagreb. And they just use it in the way that it sounds like fala, F-A-L-A. -A. So fala, that way you avoid the H and V and people will still understand you. So fala. fala. And you said um, hello and goodbye. Um, it's very easy because um, for hello, you could use bok, B-O-G, bok. Bok. And for goodbye, you can say bok, bok. <laughs> you just do it twice. Bok, bok. Bok, bok. Yes, <laughs> bok and bok, bok. See, it's very easy. It's not very hard to learn. But I think that you're right. We would we would be treated a little bit better as, as visitors if we pulled out any of that because we care to describe. Yeah. I always say anytime you travel, anywhere you travel, just learn the few basic words and try and use them as much as possible because locals appreciate it. Even if they don't say it, you will see it on their face. Okay, so Sarah would like to know, um, what's the difference between taking the ferry and catamaran in Croatia and what are the pros and cons? Okay, so catamaran is is a very efficient uh, catamaran goes fast and um, it actually runs much more often than the ferries but if you are planning to do some sun decking and taking some sun you know and sunbathing um, you cannot do that on a catamaran because they are all closed in um, sometimes catamarans are harder to travel with if you have unstable weather especially winds can can hurt the catamaran schedule and some catamarans, even if you purchase the ticket, can be canceled uh, pretty much um, half an hour before the catamaran would go. Um, and you might be stranded on an island. While the ferries are very rarely canceled, it usually takes a longer time. And they also have sun decks, so you can always go out on the ferries as well. 
Okay, um, Jill is asking, um, is it better to travel by train in Croatia or better by car? Um, I would recommend the car. Uh, Croatia is not as well connected um, with trains. There are several uh, cities that are, but mostly on the top part in the northern edge of Croatia and down towards Split, but the rest not so well. Um, so I would say either a car, sometimes buses are good too, but cars bring you a long way and you can, you know, since the country is big, you can still take it one place and then leave it on the other on the other end, it's still the same country if you travel through, especially for the coastline, I would recommend. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, as someone who spends a lot of time with Americans, how do you find that they react to the Pomelo vibe of Croatia, which seems so different from the US? <laughs> yeah, um, it's always a bit of a trick to uh, tell you know my guests to chill and to calm down, that they do not need to do everything in a single day that's, you know, I know how when we travel, we try to put all our, you know, ticks into the box, but, you know, there will be a big problem if you don't put a tick into the box of Pomalo in Croatia, because if you haven't done Pomalo, then you haven't really been to Croatia. I know that to my tour members, I always give a little bit of a trick when we are in split, I tell them you have to go to Riva and you try to sit down and try to have that coffee for a very long time. And the record so far is 45 minutes and they were super proud of it, but they told me it was very hard. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You just, I, I think you just have to be a little bit born with it. You know, in our lifestyle, we do not rush so much. Work for us is not such an important thing. It's not something that defines us. Um, it's what we do in our free time that does. Um, and I would say we really love to take time for our friends and family. And the best place to do that is, of course, to go for coffee and drink coffee and talk and exchange, um, not to rush from one place to another. You know, the way we spend vacation, it's exactly the same way where we talked with you, Lisa, and you said you go from one place to another and you try to see as much as possible. When we come to vacation, we try to see nothing at all because we just want to relax and rest. <laughs> Fiaka. Fiaka. Yes. That's my, my new word. Um, Nora asks, is it true Croatia will switch to the euro in 2023? Yes, it's true. So with 1st of January, they are switching to euros. Um, we don't know yet whether the borders will open up exactly on that same date. Um, they have an, uh, a talk right now in uh, Brussels. So where they will discuss whether Schengen will be lifted or not over here as well. So that means no more checking of the passports on the Slovenian Croatian border. Uh, we'll see about that. We're all hoping for it because in the summertime there tend to be a lot of crowds, but yeah, definitely they are accepting the euros. Um, so yeah, uh, prepare your euros and get rid of the kunas. If any of you still have kunas in your socks, I don't know, that's where we put money in this part of the world. Um, you can bring it out because for the first half a year, it will still be possible to switch it. And still for the whole year in any of the banks over to euros. Fantastic. Um, Joy wants to know, what are the best areas for walking for outdoorsy stuff like is the Istrian Peninsula or some islands? What would be good for, where should she look? Yeah, I would definitely recommend Istrian Peninsula. It's wonderful. It's wonderful throughout the whole year because of its climate. It's very mild, Mediterranean, really nice. Uh, there is this bike trail that has been built on the former train tracks. Istria for a long time has been a big exporter of grapes to Trieste, to Italy. And actually they built a train track uh, just after World War I uh, to bring those grapes to Trieste. But later on, that railway line was never used, so they tried to use those train tracks um, and turning it into biking and hiking trails. So it's today called the Path of Friendship and Peace, and you can actually go and walk or bike on it, and it's wonderful. Uh, plus, you know, um, islands all throughout have wonderful hiking destinations. Um, I know for Hvar, Hvar is amazing. We go and hike uh, sometimes in the morning a little bit. Um, and it's wonderful, but you have to do it if you're on the islands in the 
off season, meaning May, April, um, and then afterwards in October, November, because it gets very hot over there up to about 110 Fahrenheit in the summer. And then there's one area uh, very close to um, the boundary between Plitvice Lakes and the coastline called Velebit that actually has a lot of great hiking trails and the area around Zagreb is wonderful too. So plenty of possibilities if you want to be active. Well, that was that was perfect because Arthur asked if it was okay to visit the islands in the off season. It sounds like that was a yes. Yes, but try um, to check first because if you want to go to the islands in the off season, you need to check what is open because a lot of the hotels do close down. Sobes do not, but sometimes it's hard because also um, islanders go on their vacation at that time. So I wouldn't go there um, a little later than 10th of November and then up until mid-January, I wouldn't go really on the islands also because of a lot of harsh winds. Okay, so last question. Helen, a Slovenian American woman wants to know if beekeeping is as uh, important or popular in Croatia as it is in Slovenia. Well, Helen, um, hello. And um, beekeeping is big in Croatia as well, but definitely doesn't come to the extent that beekeeping is in Slovenia. Um, although they have also some really good areas for the bees. One is very close to the Plitvica National Park where you actually can find if you drive with a car or a bus, a lot of little stands along the road where you can buy your honey. Um, and then on the islands, islands do have some beekeeping, but it's usually in very small quantities and their honey will come out a bit differently. So you will even have a lavender honey, a rosemary honey or a sage honey um, you won't have necessarily pastoral or forest one. Istria is good for honey as well. Um, but again, they will have a bit of a different flavors. Um, so yeah, you can still eat very delicious um, honey, but not as developed as in Slovenia, where this is our core business, I would say, one of the biggest and most important ways of farming in our country. Oh, fantastic. Okay, let's watch the last part of the video and then we will say goodnight. Tina, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us tonight, for joining us. We hope to have you on again. It was so delightful. Um, so thank you again very much. Thank you very much, Lisa, and goodbye. Bok bok. Bok bok. <laughs> Everyone, I hope that you will join us next week. We have the Paris versus London Smackdown where uh, myself and Julianne and Ben and Gabe will all be uh, arguing the merits of Paris versus London. Um, so please sign up. We would love to see you there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Buck, buck. Bye-bye.